Good morning or good evening or um, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm Amy Barfield and I um, help run the International Virtual Science Symposium every year. And so we're really lucky because we've got some really great presenters from the IVSS who have come to share their research and the research that they um, did for the IVSS got top scores in the, in the IVSS. So they got at least a four star student research badge as well as earning two additional badges. So they've done a really good job and they were selected out of a random drawing to be able to participate in student showcase today. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Jack Kay from NASA uh, who has a few words, uh, some opening remarks. All right, thanks very much. Uh, I'm assuming you can hear me okay. Yes, we can, Jack. All right, good, uh, thanks. So um, let's start out just uh, welcoming ev everyone, um, add, add to the welcomes I'm sure that you're already getting. Um, start out really by uh, stating the obvious that uh, GLOBE is a, an important uh, program to NASA. Um, really, it's been that way since the inception. Um, and uh, we'd like to think that NASA has been important to GLOBE in part because of our uh, commitment to support um, and, uh, and, and leadership and, and proactive working with those uh, implementing the program. Um, environmental observations, especially global environmental observations is really the heart of what we do um, at NASA Earth Science. Um, we're best known for using satellites to uh, make observations about the, the, the Earth, looking at all the different Earth uh, components and getting data that are essentially just as good anywhere as anywhere else. Uh, but we also do surface-based measurements and we do airborne measurements and uh, work with a wide variety of communities in the US and, uh, and overseas. Uh, so if, if you think about what we, we're doing with GLOBE, um, you know, working with students uh, uh, around the world, um, in, in their uh, schools and, and institutions, also making environmental observations that, that contribute to our global knowledge, really complement the kinds of uh, observations that we're getting because of the ability to get observations, uh, different kinds of environmental parameters, um, different um, uh, ge geographic densities uh, that may be better than we can do with our satellites and uh, uh, different uh, spatial distributions. So there's a complementary aspect, um, but there's also just the, the, the huge benefit of involving uh, the students in making environmental measurements. Um, I think there's no better way to learn science uh, than to, uh, to do science. And, and that works well for observations. And uh, you know, by doing it as part of uh, a, a, a global community, uh, the, the idea of, of collecting the observations um, sharing them uh, and being able to look at them in the context of what uh, one's peers around the world are doing, um, as well as what our satellite data is showing. I think it's, it's a great learning opportunity. Um, I re resist the opportunity to uh, uh, just, just share some of the excitement about the things that we're doing in terms of new kinds of environmental observations uh, that we provide, and especially the way we do that in partnership with others. Um, our last major satellite launch this past fall was for the Sentinel-6 Michael Farlick satellite to look at um, uh, sea surface height, uh, continuing a line of uh, uh, ocean surface altimeters done with our partners in the US and uh, overseas, especially uh, France. And, and as we look ahead, uh, we'll be launching uh, the next in the Landsat series of satellites for looking at land cover and land use. Uh, that's Landsat 9 with the US Geological Survey. Um, the surface weather ocean topography, a next generation um, altimeter, both for oceans and for inland weather like lakes and rivers. And that's with France and contributions from Canada and UK and a major spaceborne radar with um, uh, India that will be looking at a, a variety of things in ecology, hydrology, ice, um, and um, uh, applications, um, like especially tied in with disasters. Um, and I should say on that one, we actually have an airborne campaign right now going on in the US with uh, uh, jointly with India. So this idea of, of you know, environmental observations being a global um, activity is uh, an important message and the work that you, you all are doing in, in, in GLOBE 
uh, is an important part of that. And uh, we hope we'll uh, get some of you thinking about that for the, the, the future. And, and I should say that uh, the, the whole idea of student-made uh, student, uh, observations is an exciting one to me. I remember some things that I did in my kind of uh, ancient past, um, helping to, uh, to make uh, weather observations that we could share with folks in, in the high school uh, that I was at. And uh, even I've had the privilege of being able to go out and watch a, a Globe school make uh, uh, weather observations and, and also a number of years ago be at the Globe Learning Exp uh, Expedition in, uh, in South Africa and see Globe students and mentors going off in the field. So it's all exciting to me and uh, you know, happy to be able to participate and uh, uh, you know, watch and, and share and, and, and learn. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to join. Thanks so much, Jack. And now I'm going to hand it over to Cameron. Um, and she is presenting on, let me share my screen real quick, on two common Philippine backyard medicinal plants as potential biolarvicides against mosquito larvae during pandemic times. And I'm just going to remind you, Cameron, uh, to let me know when you need the next slide, as well as that you have seven minutes to present. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So good day. Uh, again, my name is Cameron Julie Patuba, and I will be presenting our research report. Um, but before I start with my presentation, I would just like to inform everyone that you may actually scan the QR code on the lower right corner of the PowerPoint slide to view the updated version of our paper for a more in-depth explanation regarding our study. This updated version also contains some revisions suggested by the IVSS judges who commented on our entry. So thank you very much to those judges who are present today. And now without further ado, I will begin my presentation. So next slide, please. <clears throat> okay. So like other countries, especially tropical and subtropical countries, the Philippines suffers from severe public health challenges due to outbreaks of different mosquito-borne diseases, one of which is dengue. And with already limited supplies of available vector control and even more troubling, limited capacities for healthcare long before the pandemic had started, the World Health Organization recently emphasized the need for alternative but effective strategies for the prevention and detection of mosquito-borne diseases while still following strict health protocols. These may include household-level preventive measures using easily accessible materials. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, this is where biological larvicides or biolarvicides come in. Biolarvicides are actually a form of vector control that use organic and safe compounds from plants instead of conventional toxic chemicals commonly found in commercial insecticides. In this study, we examined two readily available backyard plants, moringa or malungdai and simbopokon or tanglad, which are actually considered medicinal here in the Philippines to see whether they have the potential to be used as biolarvicides against mosquito larvae. Next slide, please. So while conducting our research, we wanted to find out uh, first and foremost, if the crude extracts of malungay and tanglad may be used as biolarvicides, as I've said, to help prevent the further spread of mosquito-borne diseases and infection. Secondly, we wanted to know if uh, they possess potential larvicidal properties against mosquito larvae propagation, and if so, which one of the two is the most effective. And lastly, we wanted to see if the different concentrations of the extracts have significant effects on their overall ability to kill mosquito larvae after different observation periods. Next slide, please. So um, in here, you can see the simplified version of our methodology flowchart. And as you can see, we actually followed four main steps, namely the plant sample collection and preparation, the larvae collection and identification, the exposure experiment, and the data analysis. Next slide, please. So we conducted the first step for about six weeks, 
we acquired our samples from local markets in Mexico, Pampanga, and Paranaque City, Metro Manila, which we then air dried and pulverized using a blender. Afterwards, we collected 20 grams of the pulverized plant samples and decocted them using distilled water for two hours um, while maintaining a temperature of 80 to 90 degrees Celsius. Lastly, we filtered and diluted the extracts to obtain 0.03 grams per milliliter and 0.017 grams per milliliter concentrations. Next slide, please. For the second step, we actually made our own OV traps based on the instructional video and pamphlet posted by the Globe Implementation Office. We placed them in different shaded locations around the study sites. Then after six weeks, we harvested third and star mosquito larvae and distributed them into five ML transparent containers with five larvae in each container. We also observed a separate, a separate larva using a clip-on microscope and identified it using the globe mosquito larvae identification sheet. Lastly, we sent out the data we obtained to globe using the mosquito habitat mapper application. Next slide, please. So these are the study sites from where we collected our larvae samples. And as you can see from the photos, they are very different in terms of their environments. Uh, one consists mostly of greens and grasses, uh, the one on the left, uh, since it is found in the province. And the one on the right is mostly surrounded by many buildings and houses since it is found in the city. Next slide, please. So for the third step or the exposure experiment, we added 10 drops of the treatments. Uh, these include the extracts, the commercial insecticide, and water to the containers, which already had 3 ml of distilled water. We also did this within six replicates per treatment. Afterwards, we covered the containers with tissue paper and placed them in a shaded room with normal temperature. The larvae were checked after different um, time periods, which is one hour, six hours, 12 hours, and 24 hours uh, time marks, wherein the number of remaining larvae was reported per time mark. Next slide, please. <laughs> Okay, so now we're in the final step, which is the data analysis. We actually performed two tests for this. Uh, for the mortality assessment, we computed the percent mortality rates of the larvae after exposure to each treatment using the equation shown in the slide, wherein A is the number of living larvae before exposure and B is the number of larvae after exposure. And then for the statistical analysis, we use one way of anal uh, one way analysis of variance or ANOVA to know the significant differences between the treatments at 95% confidence level. And we also did a Duncan's multiple range test to determine which of the samples elicit significant effects in terms of percent mortality rate of larvae. Next slide, please. So for the results and discussion portion, uh, we were able to collect 180 80s mosquito larvae specimens we were also able to identify some of its body parts as shown on the slide, such as its head, the thorax, the abdomen, the saddle, and the siphon using the Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper application. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you will look in the table of the, uh, the results we've gathered, you will observe that the most effective out of all the treatments was still the commercial insecticide that we use since it was able to eliminate all mosquito larvae after one hour of exposure. This is <clears throat> okay. So this is followed by the um, 0 0.04 concentrations of Malungay and Tanglad. Um, and then lastly, the larvae exposed to water had zero mortality rates uh, even after 24 hours. Next slide, please. So more larvae uh, exposed to the extracts were eventually killed and showed a time-based um, effect on the uh, larvae. And here is a list of the existing studies that we've compared the time-based effect to. Next slide, please. And on the figure on the right, uh, it is evident that all extracts were able to uh, kill mosquito larvae, but especially the 0.04 concentrations, which demonstrate a concentration-based effect. Next slide, slide, please. So again, we compare these to existing studies, and here are the studies that also show um, concentration or dose-dependent behavior. Next slide, please. So um, we uh, noticed that all four extracts were significantly different from the positive and negative control, but the 0.04 grams per milliliter were um, 
significantly different from their 0.024 counterparts, making them um, more effective. And this may be um, because of the chemicals found in the plant samples that exhibit larvicidal activities with um, concentration-based effects. Ne next slide, please. So again, and just- you have, You're out of time, so you wanna just wrap it up? Okay, can you please uh, move it to the next slide? Sure. Uh, so overall, we found out that all four extracts were successful in keeping, killing Aedes mosquito larvae, but especially in higher concentrations, making the 0.04 grams per milliliter, milliliter concentrations um, the most effective, and they may be used as potential biolarvicides. <laughs> that is it. So yeah, again, for further research, um, phytochemical properties um, are suggested to be tested for malunga and tanglad and even other plants, as well as their activity and how reactive they become depending on varying concentrations. And then the last slide, please, sorry. So these are just my references. And on the right corner, you may actually scan this for my contact information. Thank you very much and have a good day to all. Thank you, Cameron. Next up, we've got our students from Taiwan. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to them. If you would please turn on your cameras. Thank you. And just a reminder, you have seven minutes. You can go ahead and get started. Can you press stop? Yeah, Hello, everyone. We are students from Taiwan. I'm Ying An Yan. Hi, I'm Archie. Hi, I'm Lulu. Today, we are going to report our project of expressing the effect of different open window margins on the construction of carbon dioxide in class. This report is divided into six parts. Next. How many students have in the We lost your audio. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Can you okay, my? Oh, sorry. We hope can through three different windows open to find out the relationship between windows open area and industrial to construction. Next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. This is our first time. By our current year, by our focus to experiment. After one to two months of experimentation, the resulting completed data will be analyzed differently to conclude with discussion and conclusion. Next. Research method. Yes. We use the AZ model to update the numerical range of in work field to conditions and temperature. And who to interest them in front of a classroom. One in front of the classroom and the other is behind the classroom. Next. This three is our experiment model. 
The next one is all window opening margins, and the medium is half window opening margin. The right size is all window closing margin. Would somebody Next. like to speak? Um, because I think we lost your audio. Um, please move to the next slide, please. This is all, all windows opening module. Next. Next slide. As we can see, the more students in the classroom, the higher the CO2 concentration is. And we found that the temperature seems not affect the CO2 concentration. Next slide. In case two, we got the same result. The temperature seems not affect the CO2 concentration. Next slide. Next slide. Conclude case one and case two, we, we can found that when windows were all opened, the CO2 concentration can more, has more relationship with the number of people. Next slide. This is half windows opening module. Next slide. Look at this case. We can see that when over 35 people in the classroom, the CO2 concentration is higher than 1,000 ppm. Next slide. This is another case when over 35 people in the classroom, the CO2 concentration is usually around 500 to 1,500 ppm. Next slide. Conclude case three and case four. We can find that the CO2 concentration is about 700 to 1,000 ppm. This is not only related with the number of people, but indoor temperature. Next slide. Yes, I'm going to cover the all window closing module. And this is the fifth case, which is on December 16th. The overall concentration will usually exceed 600 ppm, but also can be seen when the classroom is warmer and indoor CO2 concentration will also rise. Uh, next slide, please. And the sixth case is on December 29th. As a chart presented, you can also see that indoor CO2 is usually kept at high when there are over 35 students in the classroom and the indoor temperature is gradually increased, the CO2 concentration will also increase. Uh, next, please. First, comparing the old window closing module. You can see that CO2 concentration is was more pronounced than the temperature when there are 35 people in the classroom. Second, we, all, we also found that there were more significant differences in CO2 concentration among different group of people. The 35 students in your classroom is even twice as high as no one there. Third, when, there, when the windows are completely closed and the number of people in the classroom is large, the minimum of concentration of CO2 is significantly higher than other modules. Yes, please. And let's move to the discussion. To compare all the all window opening modules in indoor CO2 concentration distribution ratio throughout the day. And all of these are analyzed over a month and under different module. When indoor convection decreases, the radio and the radio of dangerous and notice have increases. Next, please. Analyzing to uh, analyzing the actual temperature of the three models on CO2 con concentration, and this prediction through artificial neural networking reveals that the prediction become more accurate, uh, accurate as the environment become more closed. Next, please. An experiment with the effect 
of the window opening in on the CO2 in classroom. Even you are 38 people in the classroom, and when the windows are fully open, 99% of the time concentration of the CO2 was below the APA indoor standard of 1,000 PVN. And 41% of the time, the CO2 concentration was close to environment background value. Yes, please. Please wrap it up. Um, to, yeah, may I finish my record, please? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, look at that. Uh, yeah, this one, this one. And the half an hour opening module. The CO2 is not easy to circulation, but there is still 90% of the time the CO2 concentration is lower than EPA standard. But there also have a 10% of the time CO2 concentration is soared to 1,000 ppm to 2,000 ppm or more. So it addresses health effect. Um, please move to the next slide, please. In all window closing module, when the number of people in the class are over 35, the concentration CO2 have more than or more, more time than the dangerous thousand ppm. Twenty percent over a window closing time exceed the EPA indoor standard, which is a which is a thousand ppm. It indicates that student may be drowsy, distracted, uh, and or distracted uh, as a result. And please move to the next one. We predict indoor CO two concentration in three different kind of windows opening module by artificial neural networking. An old window opening module has a large prediction error rate, and the old close, an old window close module has a smaller error rate. It shows that old window closing module is more relative a simple environment, so old window opening module has a better convection. Yeah, yes, please. And thank you for your attention. Yeah, this is a report from Taiwan. Thank you so much. So now we're going to turn it over for a question and answer. So please uh, make sure you are asking questions for either a student from Philippines or from Taiwan. And we've got a few minutes for that. So um, you can type your questions into the um, question box through Attendee Hub, our, our meeting platform. And we can go ahead and if there's any questions, um, we can go ahead and ask them. Hi everyone, um, Amy, this is uh, Peter Falcon. And uh, it's up to you, if it's fine with you. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, moderate the Q&A portion of this session. And we actually have some questions um, coming through the chat. So the first one is uh, directed at Cameron. Cameron, what was, uh, was there a difference in the results between the two medicinal plants that you used? Um, pardon? And this so, question okay. is for Cameron. So Cameron, once again, uh, was there a difference in the results between the two medicinal plants that you used? Okay, so thank you for the question. Um, based on the initial observation that we did before the statistical analysis, we actually found out that um, the 0 0.04 grams per milliliter concentration of the Malungay uh, was the most effective since it generated the highest mortality rate, which was 70%. But um, after performing the statistical analysis, we found out that there were no uh, significant differences between the four extracts, except from the 0 0.04 concentrations of both the Malunga and Tanglad from their um, 0 0.024 grams per milliliter concentration. So this means that um, both uh, the plants were just as effective but uh, we're more effective um, when, um, in, when they're in higher concentrations. So that's what we found. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent find. Thank you for sharing that. Um, our next question is for our Taiwan team. 
And a few guys, we want to know what was the most surprising part about your research? Okay, thank you for the question. And like I said, the most, uh, the most surprising part in our research is uh, we use different kind of uh, method to analyze that uh, the changes of uh, closed model and opening model. And we found that because uh, student model usually draws it during class, but after we open all the window during the class and student will not draw, not easy draws it draws uh draws it on class. So and throughout the artificial neural networking and we found that uh even you have opened the window but not completely open just you just uh open the half window and it's not have a, a lot of it's not uh, it didn't make a, a huge difference. So you cannot open all of the window then the indoor convection will be better. Yeah. So we just find out the relationship between different window opening modules. Yeah. Gotcha. Excellent. Okay. Uh, we have another question for Cameron. Uh, Cameron, how did you determine uh, to work with a third instar uh, larvae? Um, okay, so we actually based um, the majority of our methodology from the guidelines for laboratory and field testing of mosquito larvicides, which was um, by the World Health Organization. And from, the, uh, from there, um, it was suggested that the most suitable um, instar larvae that uh, must be examined was a third instar. And um, in our case, we identified a third instar using the GLOBE identification sheet, which um, had instructions on how to determine mosquito larvae instars. All right, we have time for one more question. Okay, um, this would be uh, for our Taiwan partnership, for our team. Uh, what changes, if any, um, are you making in the classroom environment after these measurements? Um, thank you for the question. And as I said, uh, after after we opened the other window and we found uh, our classmate, well, not easy uh, sleep during the class. And, but also, because after PE class and in the classroom will be well usually be smelling, but after we open all the window in just in five minutes and all of the smells yeah. are decreased. Yeah. So I mean op uh, open all the window is not but uh, it's not only better for our environment, uh, indoor environment, but also it's great for our indoor convection. Yeah. Understood. Yes. Well, uh, that's going to wrap up our Q&A portion. I just want to say uh, congratulations to both of you guys, both teams, and uh, to say thank you very much for continuing to do your GLOBE research during a very difficult, uh, unprecedented year with this pandemic. So great job to both of you guys. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Amy. Next up, we have a video from our students from Kenya. Hello viewers, welcome to our presentation identifying parts of a mosquito lava. My name is Peter Mosili and my colleague is Beatrice Lucky. We are from Tamarel Primary School, Meru County, Kenya in Africa. Introduction. Global Learning and Observation to Benefit the Environment GLOW program is meant to equip students with necessary knowledge and skills about their immediate environment their distant environment and the world at large to environmental degradation, climate change, and help make the other a better place to be. Our main objective of this research is to be able to identify different parts of a mosquito lava using the GLOBE Mosquito Habitat Mapper app and a microlens provided to us by the GLOBE program. Our investigation involved identifying a mosquito breeding site and collecting different samples of mosquito larvae, which we use as specimens. All the data we collected was recorded using the GLOBE Mosquito Habitat Mapper app and a micro lens and uploaded it using the GLOBE Observer app into the GLOBE website and later used it during our analysis. We studied the head, thorax, and the abdomen and identified the fine details of the lava like tap, pectin, comb scales, 
safe on ETC. Even though the schools had been closed for a long period, we were able to adapt to the changing globe since learning continued outside classes using Globe Observer app and other Globe learning tools. Thanks to Globe for supporting and helping us in advancing our knowledge and skills in STEM. The research questions. Are we able to identify different parts of a mosquito larva? Which parts of a mosquito larva do we use to identify different mosquito species? Why should we use mosquito larva in our research instead of other developmental stages? Tools and materials we used. Mosquito breeding site, a micro lens, a phone, and a globe observer app. Procedure. Step 1. Identify a potential mosquito habitat and take some samples of the mosquito larva. Step 2. Using a micro lens, identify parts of the larva by selecting a representative larva for some close-up photos. Use the images on the mosquito habitat mapper to compare and identify the parts. Step 3. Eliminate the breeding habitat. Step 4. Document and use the mosquito habitat mapper to send the information to the globe for knowledge sharing. Step 5. Use the data you have recorded for future analysis. Results. Major parts of a mosquito larva are head, thorax, abdomen. Siphon. Siphon is an air tube used for breathing. Pectin. Pectin is made up of spine-like structures found along the siphon. Gills. Gills are structures attached to the anal segment. Sandal. Sandal is a part that surrounds the anal segment. Comb scales. Comb scales are tiny pitchfork shaped scales or scales tapered to a single point found on the edge segment of a lava. Hair tuff. Hair tuff is a a small amount of hair growing together in one place on the siphon. Dark plate. A dark plate is a dark patch found on the A segment. Discussion. From the first photograph, we observed that a mosquito lava has three main parts. These parts are head, thorax, and abdomen. In addition to that, in photographs A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, it has other finer details which we were able to identify. These details included hair tufts, pectin, comb scales, siphon, gills, dark plate, and sandal. By identifying this part, we were able to differentiate between different mosquito species such as anopheles, killers, and dead mosquitoes. During the identification process, the mosquito larva were easy to handle. They were harmless to us and they had everything we were looking for. This answered all our questions and therefore our hypothesis was true. Conclusion From the above observations, we concluded that we are able to identify different mosquito species such as Anopheles, Culex, and Aedes mosquitoes. The parts and details that are used in identifying different mosquito species include siphon, pectin, tuff, Comscales, gills, and dark plate. A mosquito larva is the best stage for use in, in identifying different mosquito species because they are friendly, less mobile, and harmless. They also have all the parts and details required for identification. Recommendations We recommend that it is safe to control the mosquito during the larva stage since they are harmless at this stage. The method that can be used include draining stagnant water, covering open water containers, using fish and frogs to feed on the mosquito larva ETC. All the recorded mosquito data to be properly stored for future analysis and education. Research to be done on what can be done to the mosquito larva to prevent them from turning into dangerous adult mosquitoes. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Beatrice and Peter. Uh, next up, I'm gonna share my screen again. We've got our presenters from Thailand. Go ahead when you're ready. Just a reminder, you have seven minutes. Oh, hello everyone. My name is Siori Pai. Hello, my name is Shashalin Dandi. We are students in grade 11 from Princess Julapon Science High School Trang in Thailand. Today, we are going to present a project named Effect of Population Density on Burrow Characteristic in the Filler Crab. Next slide, please. So first of all, why did we study about the filler crab? In Thailand, there were about 2,400 million square meter of mangrove forest. In Trang province, there is 320 million square meter. And in Ban Motanoi community, there is 4.8 million square meter, which is equal about 0.2% of the mangrove forest area in Thailand. And in nowadays, the area and the abundance of the mangrove forest is decreased because of the natural disaster and the human habits. Except example, human destroyed the area of the mangrove forest to build their habitat. Next slide, please. And fiddler crab is a crab that can only find in the mangrove forest area and the population density of the fiddler crab can tell the abundance of the mangrove forest. So that's why we study about the fiddler crab. Next slide, please. For our research questions, we have three research questions. First, did filler crab size differ between low and high density areas? Second, did burrow characteristic differ between low and high density areas? And third, did soil characteristics differ between low and high density areas? Next slide, please. In our hypothesis, First, filler crab size differ between low and high density area. Second, burrow characteristics differ between low and high density area. And third, soil characteristics differ between low and high density areas. Next slide, please. For our study site, we study at Ban Mutanoi community in Trang province, which is in the south of Thailand. Next slide, please. For our equipments, we use 0 0.25 quadrat and precision balance two digits, candle, gas stove, boiler, planting spoon, vernier caliper, hot air oven, furnace, pH meter, and plastic bucket. Next slide, please. For our methods, first sampling point, we put five quadrat in low and high density area. Next slide, please. Second, density seg seg ratio and body size. We collect all males and females in quadrat. Sexing them, measure their body size by color bed width, color bed length, and major core length. Next slide, please. Third, borrow shape and size. We pour melting wax in burrow wait for 20 minutes to cast it and classify burrow shape in INJ shape. And measure burrow to total length and burrow diameter. Next slide, please. Fourth, soil characteristic. We found soil texture. Measure soil pH with 100 gram wet soil sample open dry. 120 degrees Celsius for 24 hours with for soil moisture open 450 degrees Celsius for four hours to get percent of organic matter. Next slide, please. For our result, graph show number of field crab in high and low density area. We found that number of field crab were higher in high than in low density area. Next slide, please. 
This table shows secretion in low and high density area. We found male more than female in high and low density area. Next slide, please. This graph shows size of fetal crab in high density and low density area. We found that in high density area, carapace width and carapace length of male and female are higher than in low density area. And in high density area, major core width and major core length of male are higher than in low density. Next slide, please. For our research, we found two shapes of burrow is I and J shape. Next slide, please. This table shows borrow shape in low and high density, high density area. We found J shape more than I shape, and we found J shape in high density more than in low density. Next slide, please. This graph shows borrow range of fetal crab in high density and low density area. We found that in high density, male and female borrow range are higher than in low density, but Female J shape in low density have borrow range higher than in high density. Next slide, please. This graph show borrow diameter of fetal crab in high density and low density area. We found that in low density, low density area, male and female borrow diameter that are higher than in high density. Next slide, please. One minute left. This graph, uh, sorry, this table sh shows soil characteristic in low and high density area. In high density, soil texture is sandy loam and low density is loam sand. Moist, moisture content and pH in low density are higher than high density, but organic matter in high density is higher than in low density. Next slide, please. So our conclusion and discussions, first in high density area, the number of filler crab is about five times compared with the low density. And the sex ratio of male per female was similar in both area for about two per one. And the size of filler crab in high density were bigger than low density because of the percent organic matter in the high density was higher than in the low density. Next slide, please. In both areas, we found two different shapes of burrow as I and J shape, and we found J shape more than I shape, and J shape is longer and larger than I shape, because from our study, I shape is a, per, a temporary habitat, and J shape is a permanent habitat using for reproductive and incubate egg, and in the low density, the female J burrow is bigger than in high density. Next slide, please. And our and benefit you're out of time, so please wrap it up. And our benefit from our research. So this research is gonna be a background knowledge for the people in the community, especially the children. So the children and the people will give more importance to the filler crab, so they will conserve them. And the conservation of the filler crab is connecting to the conservation of the mangrove forest and the ecosystem. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, some more great questions for our, our two um, teams that participated today. Uh, the first question is to uh, Lucky and Peter, to our Kenya team. And the question is, what did you use? The, the question for, um, for Lucky and Peter is, what did you use to take the larva picture? We used... This would be for, for uh, the Kenya team. We then, used a mic. Jesus. Go ahead, I apologize. We used a micro lens and a phone. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Um, our next question is for our Thailand team. And that question is what is the difference between sandy loam and loamy sand soil texture? So the difference be between the sandy loam and the loaming sand is the percent of the sand and loam. So in the sandy loam, there are more sand than loam, and the loaming sand, there were more loam than sand. 
Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, and for our keynote team, once again, um, first off, I think your research is extremely important because I got bit eight times alone last night. So I would love you to come and do some mosquito research on my house. Um, the next question is, how, how will the identification of mosquito larvae help in reducing mosquito diseases in Africa? By, by helping to identify what can be done for the mosquito larvae to be stopped from becoming adult mosquitoes, which transmit diseases. Thank you. Um, we have one more question for our team in Thailand. And the question is, did soil compaction differ between low and high density areas? I would say that the soil compaction differ. As you can see from, can see from sorry, uh, as you can see from the soil moisture content in the low density area is higher than in the high density area. So the soil compaction in the high density is more compaction than in the low density area. Thank you. And I have one more question, and this is for both teams. So the first one will go for our, our team in Kenya. Um, and then we'll, we'll ask the same question for our team in Thailand. And that question is, what is the most interesting part of the research that you've done? What was the most interesting for you? And that, and let's go with Kenya first. By the most interesting part was when taking the pictures of the lava. Was that the most fun as well? Yes. Excellent. And for our Thailand team, same question. What is the most interesting part of your research? For me, the most interesting part, I think, is for the borough characteristic part because it's really surprised me because the filler crab is a very tiny crab, but when we dig out the candle for a borough characteristic, it's really big. So it surprised us that we didn't expect that tiny crab can build a really big borough. Yes. And was that also the most fun uh, part of the project? Or was it another part that was even funner than doing that? I think it's the most part that I'm interesting about it and it's really fun. Gotcha. Well, we'll thank both teams. We, like I said, we really appreciate you continuing doing research during a very tough year um, and we're happy to have you. So great job. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to, um, to Amy. Thank you so much. And I just want to um, agree with Peter. This has been a really strange year with the pandemic, but we didn't see a very um, large number of drops in, in the number of projects. We actually were very happy and surprised to see that all of our students are continuing to join us and participate in the IVSS. And we're so lucky that we were able to see these presentations today from, your, from these students. Um, they did a great job. And we have got another student showcase session later today. So thank you all. Um, and I hope to see you all again later for our second student showcase session. Bye.